mysterywire.com home of the unusual and unknown from area 51 to the paranormal it's your source to the most vetted ufo stories and special investigations in the world take a journey into the universe of mysterywire.com leslie ricky thanks for being here i i just saw the first episode of surviving death it is spectacular it's terrific i can't wait to watch the other uh the other five episodes on netflix leslie let's uh, i want to start with you you know as topics go, uh, they don't get much bigger than this. And it's something that probably everyone on the planet should be concerned about. But uh, pe most people, like me, kind of put it off to the side. You don't think about it. Um, you don't want to think about it, especially at my advanced age. Um, but, but this project that you two have put together, it, it's hopeful. It's, it's, uh, it's positive. Uh, can you talk about uh, how you got into it, how long you've been working on it, and what you wanted the series to do? Well, those are three huge questions, so I'll try to be <laughs> brief, George. But, you know, I've been interested in this topic for a long time, because as I'm sure a lot of people know, I've been working on the UFO issue for many years, and this was always sort of in the background for me. Um, I think it's a huge question, like you say. I think UFOs are a huge question also. And the question of consciousness, so when you look into the evidence for the possibility of the survival of consciousness past death, it is hopeful. Because the more you look, the more you will see that there's a lot of different areas of research that point towards the possibility of survival. And that's what I think is so uplifting and exciting and positive about it. And in my book, I, I, I do a lot of research. I bring in a lot of evidence from a lot of different areas. We're doing the same thing in the series. And Ricky can talk more about how she approached it. It's very much has to do with people and the journeys that they go on when they experience loss or when they want to ask these kinds of questions. We can't answer the questions, but the questions are really profound, as you say, and they do affect everybody because everybody has to deal with death, their own death and the death of other people. Um, Ricky, you know, when I, Leslie told me she was working on a series, I was the, the central question was, how do you visualize something like this? Um, is it all going to be talking heads? And it's not. The, the series is absolutely gorgeous. Um, that had to be a big challenge for you and uh, as you're planning how you're going to put it together. Yeah, no, and thank you for saying it is beautiful because I, I think we're really proud of the graphics and the treatment. And it's not, I think, typical when you have these kinds of programs that are dealing with potential for, you know, possibility of afterlife or talking about, you know, ghosts or any of these topics that we get into mediums where it kind of just looks scary or, you know, it feels like, you know, that it's, there is no sort of authenticity to it. And so for us, it was really about, for me, it was listening to people tell stories and, and, and then doing the best to create what they've expressed in their, in their own experience. And I think the experiences are very profound and life-changing for many people. And I was just trying to be respectful of their personal journey, their path that they're on, and as best as possible, create the feeling around it, create what they experienced physically as they were going through these various different kinds of experiences. Did you have any beliefs going into this and did it, uh, did the work on the series change it? I really was not that interested in the topic, Leslie can tell you. It's not something I am, you know, I do all kinds of different documentaries, social justice documentaries, you name it. So it wasn't really, I'm, I was really interested in characters and either whether there was a doctor or a researcher or a scientist or just an individual who is looking into this possibility of life after death and what journey they've been on to explore this for themselves, whether in a scientific, you know, medical realm or just in a personal journey. Um, so that's what really got me into it. And I think, you know, you ask any person and they've thought about this, they've had a loss in their life, they've questioned this. So it felt very universal to me, but I didn't want it to feel like a program that only if you're interested in this topic, you're going to get something from. I wanted it to feel like you, you can have no interest in potential paranormal or afterlife and yet find something very grounded in the people's stories. Leslie, uh, I read a, a short review yesterday, sort of a teaser of, of what the series was about, and uh, the writer used the word uh, paranormal. This uh, series delves into the paranormal. Is that the word you would use? I mean, is it paranormal or is it just normal and we don't realize? I wouldn't use that word. I mean, I, you know, as a fellow journalist, I'm sure you understand the sort of 
connotations that that word has. I mean, and a lot of experiences that people have, I don't know, I don't consider them paranormal. I mean, maybe something like if you go into a mansion and you get a, a voice of a deceased person on a, on a tape recorder, which we have a quick scene along those lines, um, maybe that'll be considered paranormal just because it's, it's not scientifically accepted as possible. But I think when somebody has a near death experience, it's like well, what you saw in episode one. I mean, paranormal is just not the word that one would apply to an experience like that. It's an expansive moment of, you know, it's a learning and transformative experience that someone has. That's the way I would characterize it. And I just like to add, I think I, I agree. And I think we use the word paranormal in the series when individuals use it themselves. So there is a doctor who does research and people refer to their experiences as paranormal. I don't think necessarily he would call it paranormal, but you know, I think we've been sort of ingrained to think that these kinds of experience fall within this heading of paranormal. But, um, and so people who are interested in that, whatever that means for them, will tune into this, but that's not, I think, ultimately how we you know, have, are presenting these experiences. These are experiences that, everyday people have, they're not looking for these experiences, that they have these near-death experiences, or they go to see a medium to connect, or they, you know, the stories of reincarnation, or people who have children who've told these extraordinary stories that are then, as much as they can, verified and connected to people who've passed away. So uh, I don't think it's our intention either to, to think of the series as potentially a paranormal series. Uh, Leslie, as you know, materialistic science uh, has viewed this uh, sort of in a dim light for a long time. They, the general conclusion is that when you live, you die, that's it, and nothing else goes on, based on the idea that consciousness, whatever it is, uh, is produced by the brain. Can you give me sort of an overview of the evidence that is explored in the series that suggests there is something that really is going on, that consciousness does survive physical death? How do we know? Well, there's so much suggestive of that, George. I mean, the episode that you saw, for instance, um, in the, the case of Dr. Neal, Mary Neal, she was l dead, I mean, dead for like 30 minutes. She was a corpse when they found her. She'd been under the water for 30 minutes. And yet during that time when assumingly she had no brain activity, she was somewhere else having all these conscious experiences and, and interacting with deceased dead, you know, deceased loved ones and, came back a new person. I mean, that's just one example. If there are many cases in which the, the cardiac arrest is happening with a doctor present and they're documenting the fact that there's no brain activity. The case of Pam Reynolds is another extraordinary one where they can't possibly have consciousness and yet they do have consciousness. They're able to go out and report back things that were happening in the environment, things that they heard, things that they saw in the environment when they had absolutely no brain activity. So there's no way that the materialists can explain that. They've tried, but they haven't been able to provide a satisfactory explanation for how that can happen. And that's just one. The cases that Ricky mentioned of, of the small children that are literally, there's one child that remembered 55 accurate points, accurate facts about a, a person who lived before and, and believed he was that person. And those facts were able were verified by outside independent investigators from the University of Virginia. So it's very hard to explain something like that. But even if you don't want to accept that that is reincarnation, you, there is something going on with consciousness in that kind of situ situation that indicates it's not just something in the brain that's generated by the brain or that per kind of perception would not f be able to happen. There's got to be some other explanation for it. Leslie, it, George, if I may, I just want to say that the series itself doesn't draw those conclusions. I mean, I think Leslie's book and Leslie personally has gone on her own path, which, you know, she can tell you more about. I think the series asks the questions, you know, we, we really want to make, I want to make it clear that I don't think we have the answers and, but I think the questions are interesting and I think the questions are worth being asked. And I, you know, so if you're someone who just doesn't even want to, believe any of this, the questions are still interesting and the people's stories are still worth listening to, I, I believe. And um, and I think it leaves you even with more questions. Yeah, I that's... And I also, yeah, I mean, maybe Jim Tucker might have alluded to some of what I'm saying in our Dr. Tucker from UVA, but Ricky's absolutely right. 
the, the, the series is beautiful in the questions that it asks in, and the, the stories of the individual people that you become very emotionally involved with. It's an emotional moving journey that you see these people go on. I love that about it. I mean, I, it's not like hyper, hyper research oriented. And, you know, my book is, is more that way than the series. So it's true. It's, it's, that's why it appeals to a very wide audience. Well, I like the tone in that you're not ramming it down people's throats. You know, you have to believe this. You present exactly. evidence. I, the, the great, there's a great quote in the, in the first episode. I forget who said it, but uh, it's about anecdotes, how s science will write off near-death experiences. Ah, it's merely anecdotal. It's just stories. And the guy says, yeah, but all science is anecdotes. It starts out as anecdotes, and then you look for patterns. And there are pretty distinct patterns in the near-death experience stories that you share. That, that episode about the physician, the surgeon who goes to Chile and dies, she's without oxygen to her brain for like 30 minutes. I mean, it gives you goosebumps a little bit. She gets out, they pull her out. Amazingly, she comes back and um, there's an ambulance in the middle of the wilderness out there. It's like it was meant to be. Yeah, I mean, Ricky, you were you were on you you were on location. Obviously, you did the whole shoot of her, and you met her. I never actually met her, but she's. I think she she starts off the whole series, and she's absolutely profound. Yeah, actually, Jesse was there for that, but uh, I think the quote you have, George, is Dr. Bruce um, Grayson, who is part of the Department of Perceptual Studies at the University of Virginia in their medical school which I was also what, which is what also interested me in potentially bringing, you know, making this a series was that there are serious doctors with, you know, degrees that are very respectable um, who are studying this and have been studying this for quite a long time. Um, they haven't been that public about it because there's a stigma attached to this kind of research. And I think just now with the series, uh, they're looking to become more public because there is a wide range interest in this kind of research and talking about this. And again, you know, you don't, I'm not trying to convince anybody of anything because I'm not, I, I think I'm more convinced that I don't know anything, <laughs> you know, by doing this series. Um, but I think it's, it's sort of anti-intellectual to not ask the question. Well, whether near-death experiences are real uh, and documentable, uh, we'll let people debate that, but the effects on people who when we have these experiences are profound. I, and those, those are really moving stories, Leslie. You've collected a lot of them for the book uh, that is the basis for the series, but how this affects people, how it changes them, um, whatever it is, that part is definitely real, right? Absolutely. I mean, that's been documented by psychologists through all kinds of studies is how profound, and it'll last the entire life time of people and they don't fear death anymore. That's the biggest effect it has. Why do people come back? What is it about, you know, I, you know, I've read about near-death experiences and people have gone to the other side. It's blissful. It's hot and cold running bliss all the time. And I think to myself, well, that doesn't sound very interesting to spend eternity just in bliss. Um, and, it, but as you describe in some of these cases, they go over, they don't want to leave, but they do come back. Why is it? Why? I mean, I can't answer that except from what I've heard read in case studies is that they are often what they say is that it's usually because they have still have work to do here or they have children here. There's some purpose that they have to fulfill that has not been fulfilled yet. And so lots of them say they don't really want to go back, but they realize they should go back. And so they do. And Ricky, you know, this is these kinds of questions have long been sort of the province of religion, of faith and uh, spirituality. You know, the churches handle this stuff. What happens after we die? Uh, does this series step on any toes uh, for religion? I know a lot of scientists will probably not give it a second thought, uh, but uh, how will major religions view this? Is there an inherent conflict, do you think, or is it something they should embrace? Well, I would say this, you're, you're, you're right that this is a topic that um, engenders a lot of strong feelings in people. So uh, there will certainly be people in the medical fields who will say, I don't want to, you know, even pay attention to this for a second. There are probably religious people who will find these stories um, uh, either in line with their religious beliefs or not. I mean, reincarnation, Eastern Eastern um, religions uh, will 
you know, embrace reincarnation. Uh, I'm generalizing, but um, more so than Western religions, right? And so I think there, in some cases you'll find people who this feels very assured, reassuring to them, reassuring, and in others, they may feel it goes against their beliefs. And I think it just keep coming back to that. These are just real people who were not asking for these experiences, sharing in, in very intimate and very profound ways how it's affected their lives. And I don't think I'm one or, you know, hopefully people will give them the respect to, to I was gonna say, I don't think I'm one to say, well, that didn't happen or that didn't affect you this way. And I hope people will give them that respect to just listen to their stories take from it what you will and, and, and leave it at that. Leslie, you, uh, you've interviewed some of the great minds who have had the courage to go ahead and pursue this topic, academicians and, uh, and others, physicians, uh, in, in, and some landmark researchers, Dr. Raymond Moody, uh, who have been pursuing this sort of courageously because it's still not okay for mainstream scientists, physicians to go after it, I would think. Um, but but several of them have kind of reminds me of the UFO topic that you pursued. You know, the, the academicians, scientists who have the courage to look into it, find there really is something to study. Is it a fair comparison? The same thing is true. If you have the courage to look at it in this field, you'll find there's a lot of work to be done. Yeah, I think that's true. I certainly think the parallel with there being a, a ridicule factor in it being sort of scoffed at by the, the mainstream scientific community is definitely uh you know, it definitely fits both of the fields. Um, but, you know, I don't know, in some ways, maybe this is a little less taboo than UFOs. I think it just depends on from what framework you look at it. I mean, the, the program at the University of Virginia is just incredible. There's a whole group of PhDs and psychiatrists and, uh, you know, all kinds of neur neurobiologists and people who have been studying a lot of different aspects of this. They're doing studies with mediums and they're doing studies with children who remember past lives. And, um, you know, there's also great work being done at, um, in other places in America. So I think it's, it's getting more and more respect, but yes, um, as Ricky mentioned, these, these scientists are afraid of, have been afraid of coming forward. And I think, I really hope that this series will help change that because some of them have appeared, some of them have, you know, been brave enough to appear and they're proud to appear in the series. And I think that this is going to be a big step towards opening doors for further scientists to come out and, and get interested in it. And, and maybe, maybe it'll even lead to more research. Who knows? I, I have not yet seen the, uh, the episode on ghosts, mediums, um, but you and I have talked about this before. Let's touch on that without giving away the entire series. Um, that that uh, particular avenue takes a lot of courage for people to dive into because the idea of mediums connected with the other side has been so mud muddied over the years. You know, back in the 1890s, some of the greatest minds of the time were interested in this, found it to be credible, really dove into it. And then a couple of mediums were exposed as frauds. And the assumption was, well, therefore, all mediums are frauds. I know from your book, you took a dive into the deep end of the pool here, um, not only, uh, you know, interviewing mediums and looking for credible uh, people, but you, you, you took, a, you had your own experiences with this that, that proved right. to you there's something to it. Yeah, because one way to test, to find out about mediumship is to, to go to a medium yourself and set it up in such a way that you have, it's controlled so that there's no way the medium could know anything about you. So as I described in my book, I did some readings with mediums who I took out a different email account. They didn't know my name, my address or anything. And they were the accuracy of the information that came through was, was really extraordinary. It's just absolutely mind blowing. So something is going on there. You, you know, if it's not the, the actual deceased person communicating, it's certainly some kind of incredible clairvoyant ability that the medium has. And, you know, Ricky can add more to how we, to, I'm interested because she came to it completely from the outside. We didn't have a lot of experts, I guess, on mediumship, although we did, we did have Chris Rowe, who's the head of the SPR, it's a Society for Psychical Research in England, a very prestigious organization. But we did a lot of work with mediums themselves in the series. Um, it'd be interesting to hear Reedy, Ricky's description of that. Um, I mean, I, I think partly it was, you know, as you were saying, George, you know, avoiding the circus act of mediumship, the 
sort of defrauded kinds of cases where people are just in it for the money. And I think as we got into it a little deeper, you know, Leslie obviously had done a lot of um, vetting of mediums and found an organization um, called the Forever Family Foundation that, you know, spends time with, you know, tests the medium, however, you know, one tests them. But uh, what I found was really interesting is a lot of the mediums, they don't charge. They, do, they, they donate their time to these grief retreats. They um, are, they find I guess what was interesting to me is to find mediums who really feel that this is a gift and something that they can give people who are grieving. And again, you know, we've been challenged and asked, well, is this misleading for people? Is this creating false hope for them? If you're someone who has had a loss, who goes to a medium, is this, you know, and are you leading them down this path? And I'd like Leslie to answer that. But I mean, I think, again, it comes back to the people and the characters that we chose we tried to go for the most authentic people who were in this as their lives are devoted to it. Their lives are devoted. They feel they have a gift as a medium. Um, people who were seeking their help, you know, are wary. They're not being duped. They're not being uh, charged tons of money to go. And, and, um, and that was part of like the way we organized it. Cause sure it's, you know, I heard this from mediums. You can always get a bad lawyer. You can get a bad medium, you know? So people who are out there to cheat you, you can find someone who wants to cheat you. And maybe, you know, the field of mediumship, you know, attracts more people like the into the magician world of it all. But I think there are, people who are authentic in their beliefs, in their abilities, and um, and that really are there to help people through grief. Uh, which So Leslie, you could probably talk more about that, but I, I, I do wanna say that the history of it is fascinating and looking at it, the turn of the century and how it was, how mediums were studied and what people like Arthur Conan Doyle and Mark Twain and authors, you know, these significant authors, uh, and you think of Mark, uh, you think of um, Arthur Conan Doyle and in Sherlock Holmes, and it's all sort of fact-based, you know, evidence that you know he was fascinated by mediumship and and did lots of research into it, as did many other writers and great thinkers. So that to me was interesting. Just sort of how people approached it through the ages has been fascinating. Leslie, people who have read uh, Surviving Death, your book, will remember your personal experiences. And I don't want to, you to tell the whole story, but in general, uh, can you give us an idea of how accurate the medium was, uh, what kind of details came through, and do you think you were in communication with the other side? Yeah, I mean, I, in, you know, I allowed myself to get into that reading to such an extent that I was not, I was going to have the experience. And the experience is when you're having it that you are dealing with the people because so in my situation I was I was in communication and I'm just I'm not going to quantify it by say suppose it or allege it I'm just going to make it like it was you know make it real for people. Um, it was Bud Hopkins was one of the people who, as your viewers know, was a, a famous UFO investigator. I was very good friends with Bud and I was with him when he died. He died in 2011 and the second person was my younger brother who died in 2013. And I had two readings about two months apart. And um, they were both like, I'd say, probably 90% accurate, which is absolutely off the charts in terms of what's typical for readings. Um, in terms of the accuracy of the information they came, that came through. And what was also extraordinary to me was that the personalities of the two people came through. Uh, they were opposite personalities, and that absolutely came through in how they communicated, how they presented themselves, what their energy was like. <clears throat> and the mediums made note of that. They made, made a very strong note of the differences in the personalities. They came through with information that they couldn't possibly have known. And the one interesting thing was there was, in, in both readings, there was a bit of very personal information. There were two very personal things that were said to me in the first reading. I meditated and asked my two people, when, you, when I do the second reading, please come through again and please repeat something that you said the first time, then I'll really know it was you. Because I was, my mind was going, come on, you know, there's gotta be an explanation for this. And I thought, they're never gonna, this is just, they're probably, it's probably not gonna work, but it doesn't hurt to try this experiment, right? Where I just kept sending these messages to them, just repeat something for me, not expecting that it would happen. I get into the second reading, and again, this is somebody who doesn't know anything about me. All the bases were covered in that regard. Had never met the first medium or talked to her. And they each repeated 
the most personal and most important statement they had made to me in the first reading in the second reading. And um, you know, that to me was absolutely extraordinary. That doesn't happen very often. And so that's just an example of when you get, and when you're in the moment receiving something like that, it's very hard to explain to somebody who hasn't been there what it's like. It's just a transformative kind of expansive experience and it's hard to describe it. But Leslie, um, in episode, when we, when we bring, we, we focus on mediums in episode two and three. And I think you experience that moment when Laura Lynn Jackson is with a woman who comes in. She has no knowledge of this woman. This a woman comes in and sits with her. The woman has lost a child, a daughter in her in her late twenties, and immediately Laura, you'll see you see it in the show. Laura Lynn Jackson picks up on it and says, "I have someone coming through and saying, mom, mom, mom," and immediately you know, the personality of her daughter comes through. I was in the room when this happened and I, I have to say, I was pretty shocked by it. And I even looked at my co, Jesse Sweet, who's the co-executive producer on it. We gave each other a look like, oh my God, like it, it was pretty remarkable to experience it. And I say, I am, you know, whatever word you want to say, I am open, but I am certainly not you know, someone who has ever been to a medium or really was that interested in it. So there are moments in the series that were that are fairly shocking, I think. That, that is beautiful. I remember the, the mom's eyes fills with tears and there's other things that Laura brings through to confirm even beyond that, things specifically about the daughter that you guys captured on film. And it, it is really powerful. You can see it. And then also the, when she talks about it afterwards, she describes how it affected her. So that's the way the series is, George. It's very, it's experiential. You're seeing things happening in these people's lives as they happen. And, and they, really it changes different. them forever. Uh, one other question, we have a couple of minutes left. It's about consciousness. You know, as you know, Leslie, in the UFO world, that t term is kind of a buzzword. It's tossed around a lot, even though we don't really know what it is, you know, what it means. People try to use it to tie together seemingly uh, unconnected, uh, different kinds of paranormal, supernatural events. Uh, what have you learned about what it is? Uh, I guess the profound uh, uh, lesson from episode one is that it is not necessarily generated by the brain, that it exists separate from the brain. And if, if that is true, then it, it makes sense that it goes on when the body dies. Right. You can't prove it, of course, but that's a, that seems like a very logical theory when you look at all the evidence. And it's not just near-death experiences, it's lots of other things that all point to that being, you know, a conceivable reality. But what it is, who can say? I mean, I don't even think that the best minds, the philosophers or anybody's been able to say what consciousness is. But, you know, there is this whole field of thought that it's generated by neurons in the brain. And there's a lot of people and I'm, and, and that don't go along with that theory, including, you know, scientists and physicists and all kinds of people. So, um, but it's, it's an open question. Well, it's a lot of incidents that you document where it is separate from the brain. The near-death experience, the lady, she's dead. She is dead. Right. Doctors are working on her. She's floating around watching them, seeing things and describing things that she should not be able to see. Uh, I know that, uh, Ricky, uh, on this consciousness uh, question, uh, that I had, every time I've had a surgical procedure where I have to be put out, I make a point of asking the anesthesiologist before they put me under, hey, where do I go? And I often get the most quizzical looks on their face. Hmm. You know, some of them just, yeah, I don't know, give me the propofol or whatever, knock me out. But some of them think about it and they don't really know. They haven't thought about it. Uh, I guess in one sense, maybe it's wishful thinking that we go on. But um, uh, on the other hand, it, it certainly seems from the series, the parts that I've, I've uh, watched so far, that that there is something to it. It's not just wishful thinking. Well, I mean, I, I go back to the raising the questions. I, I, I don't, I wouldn't say as strongly as Leslie that I think that the series is, and I, and I think, you know, Leslie, you did say that we don't know. I think that's what the series really points at. It, it looks at and asks the questions. And, um, you know, I think some people will say, they'll push back on this. The doctors will push back and say, you know, there's all these other kinds of explanations. And our doctors who are doing this research and who have done this research will push back against them and say, no, 
we looked at medicine. It's, you know, when you have this kind of medicine, you don't have that kind of experience. They looked at, you know, lack of oxygen. Well, when you have lack of oxygen, you don't have a peaceful experience. You have a different kind of, so they've tried, we, we have asked those questions in the series, posed those questions to our doctors, sort of the skeptical questions. Well, could it be this? Could it be that? And we've allowed the people in it who've done this research to answer those questions as best that their research has allowed them to. But the questions go on, and I think that's what makes it intriguing. Uh, well, Ricky, Leslie, congratulations on the series. It's terrific work, what I've seen so far, and I have every intention of binging the rest of it this weekend. Uh, thank you for being here, and uh, uh, great work. Thank you, George. Great to be with thank you. you. Mysterywire.com, home of the unusual and unknown. From Area 51 to the paranormal, it's your source to the most vetted UFO stories and special investigations in the world. Take a journey into the universe of mysterywire.com.